Thank you. Uh, excited to, and honored to have the chance to speak again here today. As you all watch me wander around this morning, this time I don't have a clicker, so I'm going to do my best to, to not walk too far from the computer. Um, so in, in case you didn't, didn't have a chance to see me earlier, uh, my name is Connor Jensen. I work for Data IQ. Uh, I lead our field CDO team. Uh, happy to answer more questions about that, but in the interest of uh, talking about the, the real stuff, let's talk about uh, overcoming and preventing AI project failures, and what are the things that we've seen that can help you be ensure a greater chance of success, and more to the point, when a project doesn't go well, how can you recover from that? Uh, you already heard who we are and who I am, so I'll just move straight into the meat of this. So, as a starting point, why do AI projects fail? Like, we hear about this all the time, right? You know, the the it's always fun to talk about the statistics of 87% of all AI projects fail or 60 something percent never make it to production, uh, things like that. You hear different numbers all of the time. Uh, and there's also different you know, timelines around how that can take, right? Sometimes you talk about, oh, well, we've built it. How long did it take us once we've designed it to build it into production, you know, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months sometimes, right? So you know, these are all things that we hear about all the time, but why, why do we hear about these things? And, what are we trying to accomplish with these to begin with? Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. AI has a lot of potential for us to improve uh, how we do what we already do. It's one of the things I said this morning, right? Like AI isn't gonna change you into a tech company overnight. It's gonna make you better at what you already do as a company, uh, whether you're in healthcare, in finance, in news and media, whatever that happens to be. But it's hard. It's hard to do it, um, and especially for companies who are less mature, who are trying to do this for the first time, or uh, sometimes even your second time or your third time with your third data science team, uh, you're still learning. And, and like I said, there's no data science development life cycle yet, right? Agile doesn't fit this process. Waterfall doesn't fit this process. We don't have this fully baked and realized yet. We're still figuring these things out. Um, we do know some things though. We don't know everything, but we're getting there. One of the things that we see though is there are very critical gaps and there's a lot of handoffs that create additional friction in the process that we need to be able to move through and improve. So as you think about all the different people involved in both building these applications and deploying them and putting them in the hands of your end users, you know, think about we've got a data engineer and a business me sort of talking about what's the problem and you know how do I get access to this data. We've got a model, a machine learning engineer or a data scientist who's building a model with that data. We've got a risk manager maybe who's asking a lot of questions about how are you gonna use this data? What data is going into it? How does it work? Uh, sometimes, you know, if you're in regulated industries, you're going in, you're sitting in front of, you know, company or in regulators to justify how these things are working. Then you've built a model and you think you want to use it. Now you've got IT operations people or maybe they're DevOps people or maybe they're ML ops people. Who knows, right? There's a whole bunch of variety of different skill sets, different people coming into this, figuring out how do I take this and deploy this, right? It's software, right? It's just code. I just employed this code, but it's not just code, right? Models degrade over time. They devolve with the data. There are a lot of different nuances to deploying these capabilities than just pushing a piece of code out into production. Uh, you've got people who now need to use this model to make new or different decisions or make the decision they already made hopefully better and different. So now you're having to train them on how to interpret it, how to work with it. You're having to maybe build interfaces for it. So you've got IT people and architects or you've got data scientists, but what about your UI, right? So as we work through this process, there's so many people involved in just getting it built and then getting it out the door. And then, like I said, that model will degrade. You know, a model is a map, a statistical map of an underlying reality where we're trying to use data to predict something about the world, but the world changes. So those models, the day that it goes out to production is as good as it gets. And every day that it's out in the wild, it's gonna get a little bit worse. So we have to be able to monitor the performance of these models and redeploy them, rebuild them, and not take the same amount of time that we did to build it and deploy it in the first place. The other challenge here is, you know, I'm talking about this as you though you're gonna build one model. But as you scale your team, now you're talking about You've built 10 models, you've built 100 models, you've built 1,000 models. Look at customers like some of our larger customers who have over 1,000 users and who have 60,000 models in production. How do you manage that 
scale. When all of these things that we talked about in one model, you're now trying to do at scale across tens of thousands of live models that need to be maintained, deployed, redeployed, et cetera. Because if you don't, this is what you'll hear. It's all garbage. It's garbage in, it's garbage out. I don't know how to use it. You didn't train me on it. I don't want to work with it. It made my operations slower. This sucks. Go away, data science team. Maybe it's just me that heard that, but. So how do you move from this, trying to manage this at scale, and hopefully make more successes, less failures? So those three problems that we hear about, too much bad data, too slow to operate, and too messy to scale. Let's talk about those each. So what's under, what's under that idea of too much bad data, right? A lot of data. How do I find the right data? How do I clean the data? How do I make sure that everybody's using the same data? How do I have all these different people are using the data collaborating to make that data better and easier to use? Uh, how do I stop spending most of my time just trying to do quality control on data or fixing the same thing over and over again or trying to reconcile why 10 different people came to me with the same revenue number, but it was 10 different numbers, right? The first piece is very much how do you make it as easy to discover and access data as possible. Obviously, we've been talking about this for a long time is how do you make that? You have data coming out of operational systems. We've got warehouses. We've got lakes. We've got swamps. We've got lake houses. We've got all these different things that we've built over the years to try to make this easier. Now we've got data mesh. Now we've got data fabric. There's all these different approaches to doing this, but just putting the data in one place or putting all that, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem until you can make it so that as many people can access that data where it is as easily as possible and stop talking mythical data migrations and transformations where we're gonna build you a big, beautiful warehouse and it will all be perfect. Second piece is collaboration. How do you make it so as many people, again, can access that data where it is and have collaborations around, this is how I'm using this data. This is how I'm putting this data in. You know, classic examples of, you know, oh, well, we have a drop down menu when somebody enters the data and there's 10 options and 60% of the responses are zero other, right? It's not helpful to me, but did you ever go ask the people who are inputting that data why they put zero other all the time, right? How do you do that? How do you make it so that you can have those conversations between the people who are creating the data, the people who are cleaning and building models with the data and the people who are using all of that data? Uh, favorite example of mine is always when we'd start a data science project, I'd send my team on a research mission, which was to go sit down and watch somebody use the data. How do you make this decision today? We're not building brand new processes in most places, right? We're talking about improving a data set or improving a process that somebody already works upon. So watch the process. What screens do they go to? What do they click? How do they make this decision today? How do you improve what they're already doing, not in a, you know, with a blank sheet of canvas design the optimal process that actually probably won't work. Again, together, more people together is better. And then usability by making things, having some sort of catalog or feature store or something where you have that blessed data available, right? There's a lot of different ways to solve this, but it is a critical component to sort of say, make the sort of corporate standard data as easily as accessible as possible. Right? The more barriers you put into somebody being able to get that data, the faster they're going to go around you to find a different way to get to it. And so, you, so there's a lot of different ways to solve this. You know, feature stores being sort of one of the most common latest ones that people are talking about. But <clears throat> put your data sets in one place. Put the models in one place. Put the applications in one place. Make it as easy as possible for people to find the data you want them to find. Don't create a big library of blessed data sets and then create a 25 step process with 12 approvals that a person has to go through to get access to that data. <clears throat> Dataiku, uh, one of our customers, uh, Bankers Bank, uses Dataiku to solve this problem very explicitly. Um, managing data from multiple sources, providing access to it all through Dataiku as that sort of central source, again, doesn't have to be data IQ, but you do have to have that single source or as few sources as possible. Uh, and what they were able to do in terms of moving through that was move as many people into that, have one place where people were supposed to go to look for data first, had a request process for if you can't find the data, how do you ask for it? Uh, and they moved from what it tended to be, they saw an 87% reduction in the time to get access to data and to do an analysis. So instead of somebody spending two days trying to find the data, they spent 
20, 30 minutes getting the data and responding to the question, right? So this is how you get that flow going. You just make it as easy as possible, putting it in one place, giving as many people access to it and encouraging them to work together. Second thing we talked about is too slow. <clears throat> We're always too slow. Doesn't matter how fast you are, you're too slow. So why is it slow? We talked that that big racetrack before, right? All those different people and all of those different process or people involved in this process. And in a lot of cases, all of the tools and the handoffs that you have along the way. When you have to have one team that pulls data out of your data warehouse with SQL and sends it to the data scientist who loads it up into SAS or works with it in you know, a Python notebook and they finish their model and they send it over to the DevOps team who then goes and they code something in Java to integrate into a front end and then the front end team comes into it, right? So like, these are all hard handoffs in the process that create gaps because it's impossible to have that sort of like handoff without a gap and it creates extra time. So you need to reduce the number of this, those handoffs. The second thing is just how do you avoid recoding everything to put it into production, right? Uh, I'm gonna say this as nicely as I can and I say this as a data scientist, but data scientists are shit coders. They like to think otherwise and I'll say that there is the 1% of them that came from a software engineering background that actually knows how to write production code. And if you're out there, you're probably not actually, but you think you are. Data scientists aren't engineers. They don't know how to write production code in the vast majority of cases. And you know what? They shouldn't have to. They don't need to be production engineers. They need to be data scientists. They need to know how to work with the data. They need to know how to work with the algorithms. They need to be able to build the models. We need to help move those models into production in a way where you're not trying to refactor someone's terrible Python code that they think is beautiful, or teach your, our engineering teams how to do all that as well. How do we package these things in ways that we can deploy and move them? We've got containers, we've got DevOps processes that can help us get there. Uh, and then the production side of things, right? So once we've actually made this sort of production version of it, how do we get it into the hands of users? How do we embed it in a front end? How do we hook it to a UI? How do we create a dashboard? Again, making those all as easy as possible is how we get there. So first one is how do you make it so that what you design is what you operationalize? Work with tools that allow you to take something the way you've built it and push it to production. If you're Netflix and you have hundreds of software engineers and you want to be able to build an entire process that allows you to implement something written in a Jupyter notebook, cool. If you're not Netflix and you don't have hundreds of software engineers who can do this for you, buy a platform that allows you to do it. Build in a simplified, again, back to my from this morning, simplify and add lightness. Make as few tools in this process as possible to make that process as streamlined as you can get it. Make it end-to-end, -end, look at that whole end-to-end -end process. And end-to-end -end doesn't mean from when the data scientist gets data and finishes training their model. End-to-end -end means from when somebody puts data into a system until somebody makes a decision, look at that entire process as how you're doing it. Do those research trips. Send your developers out to sit with the people who are going to be putting data in the system. Look at the people who are going to be using it to do those analyses and help think about that whole system. Uh, and then finally, do it with production grade AI infrastructure. Jupyter on your laptop is not production grade AI infrastructure. Your own, I'm the data scientist who likes to have all the ability to tinker with whatever I want, so I have my own AWS credentials and I have my own stack that I built that I made this model on that doesn't exist in production. It's not production infrastructure. Use the infrastructure for building that you're gonna use for deploy. That does mean you need to be able to think quickly about how you adapt that production infrastructure to let data scientists work through new things. Um, I've built teams where we had, as part of our data science team, an, an R&D team that was specifically there to test out new tools, test out new packages, build those, and work with our infrastructure team to put those into production in something that wasn't, I need this Python package and six months later, somebody installed it in an edge node so that I could use it, right? So you have to be working on both sides of this. Data scientists need to be working within those guardrails, but you have to have an IT team that's working with those data scientists very proactively to have that architecture moving as the space moves. Uh, an example of a customer of ours, um, they would do analyses on sort of new markets for PE acquisitions, if I remember exactly. Um, and every time it was, you know, they'd get a bunch of CSVs, a bunch of people would go do all this manual work, and it would take them, you know, two, three, four, six weeks sometimes to be able to come up with an answer, or 
They worked until the answer was due and then the answer that they gave was as good as they could get. By leveraging some of these things, again, sort of that standard architecture, putting people all into one place and using the infrastructure to deploy that they built on, they were able to reduce that by about 85%, the amount of time that it took them to create these by building these as repeatable flows in a design area that they could push into production. All right, and finally, too messy to scale. How do you rely on standards and templates, right? We need to, we need to work within guardrails. You know, it's, I love experimenting and I love tinkering and it's fun to try and build new things with, you know, all the freedom in the world to install and do whatever you want. But you actually need some of those constraints if you want it to work within the larger ecosystem that you work within. How do you check against business requirements? Make sure that the project, the product you're building is actually going to solve the problem that the business has. Uh, and how do we sort of keep that big picture? So adopt patterns, um, use blueprints, use projects that have sort of pre-built flows or have pre-built data accesses or things where everybody is starting from the same starting point. Uh, use common code environments or other sort of shared libraries to make sure that everybody is working within that same framework. Build guardrails in place so that you can move fast and push things out to production, but where you have some of those data access controls or you have uh, bias checking and subpopulation analysis or other things that can be implemented to make sure that this model is performing the way that you want it to perform and that the business person is the one that's signing off on that, not the data scientist. And then as much as you can, and this is easier said than done, track all of your models in one place, right? So again, the less places you're productionalizing, the easier it is to keep track of all the things that you've put in production. And that's an easier way for you to be able to then track the ROI and the value of what you're getting out of the investment you've made. CFOs and boards like to understand how the large checks they're writing in AI personnel and infrastructures are coming back and actually paying the bills. If you have to go to 20 different sources to answer that question, it's gonna be a lot harder to do than if you simplify where you're productionalizing all of that and think about what's the value or how will we track the value of this project before we put it into production. Uh, an example of a, of a customer who did this, Australia Post, was having staffing challenges, um, especially with like COVID and what was happening with both the volume of shipments like increasing and having the challenges putting people in place. So they built a series of models, a demand forecast, a staffing forecast, and a bunch of things together, uh, saved like $15 million in their first year, and had improved customer experience by having these things sort of again. But they started with a template, they put all the things together in one place, they knew how they were gonna track the value when they were done, uh, and it was very successful for them in being able to build this. So I know I'm running real fast trying to get through all of this. Uh, hopefully people got good pictures and. Uh, I'm certainly happy to answer any other questions, and I hope that this freaky, weird animation doesn't bother you as much as it bothers me. Um, marketing, I love them. Also, I like that the arrows actually are going in the same direction, whatever. That's what happens when you leave marketing to design slides. So anyways, what's our three ingredients for how do we overcome these problems? How do we get around, around these projects? So make it so that people can discover, clean, and leverage the right data in as easy a way as possible. Make access to data a priority. Second, operationalize how you have that path to production. And again, simplifying that stack in as much as possible and setting those guardrails will help you there. And then those reusable patterns. Use reusable projects, use reusable data sets, use things so that people are starting from the same place as often as possible so that path to production is as easy as you can make it. And hopefully that makes it so that you have a trusted way so that as you scale these out and you start, so you stop trying to solve this one at a time and you're able to do it at scale. And I don't think we have time for questions, so you're welcome to come see me afterwards or come visit us at the booth. I hope this was helpful. Thank you very much for your time, everybody.